everyone. Hey, Spotifyers, click or tap the banner to. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Careers to Entertain, where we explore different pathways in entertainment and highlight our very own Cal State LA alum. I'm Terry Lopez, chair of the Cal State LA Entertainment and Arts Alumni Network and advisory council member on the CSU Entertainment Alliance. This event and previous and future events are recorded and archived for later viewing. If you're interested in viewing these recordings, you can visit our Entertainment and Arts Alumni Network website to request the link. The, we, the website should be in the chat right now. All of our network and CSU Entertainment Alliance programming aims to benefit alumni and current students to enrich our community with personal and professional development tools to help you succeed in the industry. A little bit about myself. I'm a 2003 CSULA graduate and currently work as Director of Inclusion and Equity at the Writers Guild of America West, where me and my team work with producers, studio and network executives, agents and managers, and writers to advance diverse representation across the industry. The Entertainment and Arts Alumni Network's mission is to foster and support a community of alumni in performing visual, film, TV, and media arts. We want to build bonds of camaraderie among alumni and to champion lifelong involvement with Cal State LA and serve as a resource for graduates to maintain mutually beneficial relationships, advance career goals, and support our shared passion for our respective crafts. Our alumni network has existed since 2010 and has over 1,600 members and growing. We are so excited to learn from our featured guest speakers but before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping rules to help you get the most out of our time together. First, please be aware that this session is being recorded. During the program, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom um, screens. Since we are among friends, we also encourage you to say hi to your peers in the chat and drop your LinkedIn and or social media handles if you are comfortable. You will, receive, you will receive, excuse me, a link to the recording after the online seminar in the next few days when it's available. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's guest, Daniel Knopf, class of 1982. From HBO to Stars, primetime network television series and Marvel, award-winning writer, producer and showrunner, Daniel Knopf's name has become synonymous with excellence in the unusual, iconic, and unexpected. Recently, Knopf took his first foray into family programming, serving as creator, executive producer, writer, and showrunner on Nickelodeon's hit original live action adventure series, The Astronauts, one of the most ambitious and, and cinematic projects Nickelodeon ever brought to the small screen. The series followed the adventures of five middle school kids who embark on the journey of a lifetime when they are mistakenly launched into space. A native to LA, Knopf grew up with an innate love for storytelling. While pursuing his bachelor's degree at CSU LA, he put his dreams of becoming a writer on hold and launched a career as an employee benefits consultant. Nearly two decades later, Knopf broke into television in a big way as the creator, executive producer of his depression era series, Carnival, which won five primetime Emmys and set audience records for HBO. Following Carnival, Knopf produced and wrote on the hit stars series, Spartacus, Blood and Sand, and served as writer showrunner on Dracula for NBC. One of Knopf's most notable projects to date is his work as executive producer and writer on 66 episodes of the award-winning, critically acclaimed NBC hit series, The Blacklist, earning nominations from the People's Choice Awards, Screen Actors Guild Awards, Primetime Emmy Awards, the Golden Globes, and the ASCAP Film and Television Music Awards. While writing for television has been Knopf's primary focus, he has also created and written gaming, digital narrative content, and collaborating with his son, Charles. Comic books, including issues of Iron Man for Marvel Comics, as well as reboots of the Eternals and Captain America. While he got his big break later on in life, Knopf's writing has been derived from observing moments firsthand. 
taking the audience along for a breathtaking ride, sometimes dark, sometimes challenging, but always redemptive. I will now hand it over to Dr. Hackle to begin this evening's discussion. Thank you so much, Terry and Daniel, welcome. Hi. It's so great to see you today or almost see you. There you are. Yay. There I am, hey. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're very excited to talk to you. And uh, you were, as we were just discussing um, before we went live, you were an English major here at Cal State LA. Yes, I was. I, it was, I was, I'd gone to a, a couple of different colleges and, and was sort of bouncing around. I, I just, you know, took what interested me, you know. Um, and, and so I remember going into the counselor's office and I had like a, you know, transcripts from three different institutions. And they said, yes, which one am I closest to? Like, what major am I closest to finishing? Because that's going to be my declared major because I just, <laughs> I just needed to get a degree, you know? And if the guy had said ping pong, I would have been like, you know, I would have had a ping pong degree. But he goes, well, look at all these. You've taken more English classes than anything else. I said, great, I'm an English major, you know? Um, and so I graduated with a degree in English. Um, always had sort of an interest in screenwriting, but didn't major in it. Um, I'd gotten some advice early, actually, the, the, you know, saying that uh, better to get a degree in English or literature, because, um, and I kind of agree with that, because, uh, ah, not, not, not to step on your toes, Christina, Sorry. but, you know, <laughs> almost everything you'll learn in a two-year degree, or a four-year degree at a, at, a, at a film school, you'll learn within three days of being on a set, and, I mean, if you if you're if you're watching and you're paying attention to the process, um, but may, what you won't get is you won't get the camaraderie of um, of working together with people. And after you graduate, you know, graduates help each other out. So um, it's good to build that kind of a network while you're, you know, before you start your career, um, which is something that you know I I didn't have going in. I mean, I went in with I knew nobody, so. Um, that's an advantage to a film degree. And that's the main advantage. I mean, really, if you're gonna focus, if obviously focus on filmmaking and learning the process, but um, also very much, it's, it, this, is, this is a collaborative process. You've heard that a million times, you're building pyramids and there's a lot of hands on it and learning how to work well with others, play well with others is a key thing. Nobody wants to work with people who are dicks. So, you know, learning how not to be a dick <laughs> It's very important. Probably a good thing to do in college. But when you were here, you did you always want to be a writer? Were you were you working on different scripts or stories or poetry while you were here at Cal State LA? Yeah, I mean, I was always uh, I I uh, I was actually started uh, my college career in art, um, and and um, so when I when I first graduated from, I was like that kid in high school who's like the artist guy, you know, it's like, oh yeah, we got to have him on the, you know, yearbook staff and, you know, and so I came in um, doing art and um, I took a creative writing class at, Pal at Pasadena City College um, with a woman named Jereen Hewitt, who was a wonderful first year writing teacher because, you know, you could do no wrong in her class. You could just write crap and she'd tell you how terrific it was and and um and so I was sort of encouraged and, and I found that as I was moving into my second year that the writing classes were kind of crowding out the art classes and I think that's because um you know you're at that point I'm writing I'm not writing um as a, a dramatic writing I'm just doing you know just fiction and poetry and um, there's there's just no bigger canvas than the inside of somebody else's head, and um, and I I I liked working with that, and um, the screenwriting was something that had intrigued me even when I was at PCC. I was I I, I was monkeying around with it and and playing with the form. Um, when I was a kid, we used to do like um, uh, my friend 
um, neighborhood friend, his dad had a real, the real tape recorder. Uh, yeah, Santa log, man. Um, and we would record what we fancied were like funny tapes. Um, so we would, we, it took us a little while to learn, oh yeah, no, we should write some of this stuff down so we can perform it. And we, we kind of did a lot of that, you know, sort of putting on shows for each other when we were kids and making super eight movies and, and doing that. So it's always been something that's always been something I did and that I was, I, I was good at, you know, the other kids would say, what, what next, you know, and I'd be always, okay, now, you know, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna, we're okay. How, we, we're gonna, we're gonna shoot each other with guns and, you know, go, go steal some powdered jello from mom's, you know, cabinet and rip it open when you fall in the pool and you get a nice big plume of you know raspberry blood and you know it's just you know, goofy stuff like that um so coming up yeah uh, it's always an interest um became more of a serious thing later on how did uh, tell us about that shift how did you um how did it how did you build your you know we talk a lot about having a portfolio of scripts um you know especially for writers did you did you create a portfolio of scripts did how did that how did the transition from post post college happen well I started taking some classes at night um at UCLA extension and I think I I wrote my oh uh, the first script I wrote was um was something called the legend of hatchet jack it's like uh, one of those you know camp in the woods teen slaughter movies you know it's like have sex get murdered type you know <laughs> that were so popular back in the in the 80s and uh so um i wrote i wrote the i wrote that and um i uh i sold one or two you know i mean i kind of i was uh, you know, nothing got made. It was just sort of tinkering around while I was, you know, feeding my family with my day job. And, um, and I, I just worked really, I mean, I just, every Tuesday and Thursday night, I had the advantage because back then computers weren't, you know, weren't, weren't all over the place. You know, you had to have access to a computer and at my, at my office, we had uh, word processing. And so I would go in Tuesday and Thursday nights when once I helped my, my wife put the kids to sleep and um, spend a couple hours working on the next script. And I managed to write about two scripts a year. Um, and there, there, there were, you know, there, then eventually they just got better and you get, you know, you get, you, 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 your work gets cleaner. And I was again, taking classes at UCLA extension um and getting some encouragement there and then there's also i was going to the afi alumni association had a workshop back then that i would go to and we would read each other's work and there's a ton of those in la a lot of resources for writers i would urge you to join one hopefully you'll kind of outgrow whatever you join you know fairly quickly um i'm uh, there's a certain point where you're not learning anymore you're just teaching and um and it doesn't, it's not helpful when people are going, oh, your stuff's so good. I mean, it's, it's great for your ego, but it's, it's not going to make you a better writer. I mean, the truth is, uh, you know, uh, when somebody tells me how good I am, it's like my hand just sort of moves toward my back pocket to see if my wallet's still there. I mean, this is Hollywood. <laughs> um, and you don't learn anything from, from, you know, being great and people telling you how great you are. Um, and that, that's death art, really. I mean, where, where you really learn things is where it doesn't work. And and a lot of people can tell you in, in Hollywood, they will, you know, if they, they will tell you how terrific they are if you happen to be on that list of people to say nice things to. Um, but your audience isn't, on, uh, they're, they're not invested in that list. And, and the truth hits hard if nobody's watching your stuff or relating to it or you you know, you're, you know, you're just not connecting with an audience. And that's the whole point, you know. When did you feel that you did connect with an audience? What was, what was the project that you feel like took you there? It was weird. I, I was at uh, UCLA Extension and uh, they had this class. It was really an interesting class. And it was uh, 
it was a short film and they you had to try out for it um and they were like they chose uh, i think 15 people from each discipline producing directing and writing i submitted a short comedy and um then they winnowed it down at the end of the first semester they decided okay we're going to make three of these things so uh at that point they well in the class you were given a mentor my mentor was jan fisher who was one of the writers on um uh the um oh, what was that vampire uh Kiefer sutherland um so the boys something boys Oh, right. Lost Boys. Uh, Lost Boys. Jan had co-written Lost Boys. And Jan said, you're really, you're very promising. And she really, she took me under her wing. So we ended up making that that short film. Um, and uh, they premiered them at the writer's guild or at the director's guild. And I remember sitting in the audience and just my impression of the experience was that there was a comedy and it was dead silence in the theater. And I just remember thinking, oh my God, oh my God, this is not good. And I walked out, all of a sudden everybody was inexplicably congratulating me. And I was going, but nobody laughed. And they go, are you kidding? They were roaring. It was like people were like, like, like everybody was like laughing through the whole thing. And I think it's just sort of like a, a, a like, like, it was like the beginning of um, of, of Saving Private Ryan. I, I think, you know, some shell went off in my head and just, you know, I was in such a state of trauma that I couldn't hear the laughter in the audience. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that was, that was an experience, but I did, I did kind of break through with that. It was the first time something had been filmed and that I, I saw it. Um, and, um, and, and I, I had the relationship with Jan and she and I, went on to write a couple of scripts together that never sold. But um, mentors, very important. Again, if you're, a, if you're an aspiring, um, if you're an aspiring uh, uh, writer, and please don't decide I'm gonna be your mentor. Uh, um, <laughs> don't write me, don't ask me. I mean, there's ways to get them. One would be just stand out, just stand out, do your best work. Um, if you have an opportunity to be brilliant, be brilliant and do your best to be brilliant and and somebody will notice um and that somebody may be somebody who can you know help you along with your craft um another way believe it or not social networks um you know don't lead with be my mentor or what can you do for me if you are lucky enough to have somebody like me following you on facebook um say you know write them a very carefully worded you know, I'll, uh, thank you for following me, you know, um, wait a couple of weeks. Hi, I was wondering, would you mind if I asked you a question about screenwriting? And, uh, you know, ask something specific, you know, not general. Um, spend six months cultivating that relationship online. And, you know, you, that person may end up becoming a mentor to you. Um, and also keep your eye open um, for your teachers and so forth, people along the way that are in the business, um, or people that just happen to know that are in the business, you know, if you got like an uncle or cousin, you know, um, but I had two mentors in my career. One was one I met, um, doing the UCLA extension. And the other one I met on the set of my first, uh, picture for HBO was, uh, a Western and he was a drama coach, um, uh, named Cliff Osman, and he was my second mentor. So that's really valuable advice. God bless those guys. You know, I, 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 they're both gone, but I owe my career to them. You know. You did. You did a lot of. You did a lot of screenwriting. When did you start focusing in on television? It was a fluke. It was a complete fluke. Um, I had sold a script called. Um, Canaan's Way to HBO, which they made, which was Blind Justice with Armand Asante and, um, and Elizabeth Shue and Robert Davi. Um, kind of a fun spaghetti Western directed by a, a British guy who really didn't understand the idiom at all. <laughs> that was, you know, um, and, um, 
and, and so uh, that that was I remember going to I was in Arizona and went to visit the set and you know you got really if you're fortunate enough to have a western be your first movie I mean it's amazing it was, there's cows I guess there's, there's there's horses and there's guys with guns and everybody's practicing and there's a camaraderie you're usually on location um you got a 360 degree fantasy land in sort of some western set and um and I remember thinking it occurred to me as I was going down I thought what if this is it what if this is the only one anybody ever does mm -hmm. and uh sure enough that kind of happened after I did Blind Justice um it, nothing was happening it was just like I had a I had an agent I made this huge mistake guys don't make this mistake this is like i've made every mistake okay um i'm like the guy who steps on every mine in the minefield <laughs> um but i never step on the same mine twice um but don't i had i got an agent all of a sudden i had an agent it was like oh great now i don't have to hustle my stuff anymore the agent will okay well guess what the agent's only making 10 percent so the most you can count on him to do is 10% as much as you do, okay? So when you get an agent, you just keep hustling. You know, you keep finding, you know, somebody wants to read your script, you know, get it, don't expect them to get it in front of people. If they do, great, wonderful. If you get it in front of somebody and that somebody ends up producing it and you get paid and the agent gets 10% for doing nothing, well, that's just the way that goes. Um, but uh, do not stop. And I mean, I still do this. I'm been I'm I'm you know, successful, um, and I still am constantly hustling for the next job. Um, and so you really you never get to just you know lay back and go cool. There's a few people that do. Um, a handful you can count them literally on one hand of people who can just sit back because people are lined up with offers, but odds are that's not going to be you. Okay. Um, and if it is you, God bless you. Um, can I have a job anyway? So uh, yeah, in any case, I was answering a question. I lost my train of thought. Um, no, that's, it's really valuable advice. I always think of the line in Tootsie where, uh, where his agent says, my job is to field offers, field offers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah that's the way it goes that's the way it works um but TV, oh that's right okay so tv yeah the way i got into tv is um so I, I i was very frustrated nothing was happening i was in a in the crest of a slump um and i thought oh well what i at the mean in the meantime i'm doing this health insurance gig so i'm i'd set up a web i'd set up a website for my company and I'd set up websites for friends companies and I was good at setting up websites. So, um, cause I had the graphic art stuff and I knew, you know, I knew how to make something pretty for web 1.0. And, uh, so I thought, well, I'm going to make myself a, a website and it was called unmovies, um, yeah, unmovies.com. And I'm going to, I'm just going to post, um, it'll be like an online resume and that way I don't have to hand people scripts. I'll just put the first acts of everything I've ever done up on the uh, website and I was posting, they didn't have a word for it then even for blogs, but I was basically doing a blog too. That was my adventures in screenwriting, my hapless, st stupid adventures of failing, you know? And, um, and so, uh, and so I had quite a following at a certain point for, uh, and, and um, I got a call uh, out of the clear blue from this guy, Robert Keobod. And he said, we'd like to see the rest of your pilot. And I'm thinking, what pilot? Because all I had on there were screenplays. And I went, oh, that thing. And I had written the screenplay and it ended up, it was just crazy. I started the screenplay and, it, and, and I got to page 120 and I wasn't finished. I got to page 180 and I wasn't finished. I had like page 230 and I wasn't finished. And I was going, oh my God, what have I grabbed onto here? And, uh, and that screenplay I just thought was this raging dark animal, you know, and, and that screenplay is called Carnival. And 
So I thought I went to a writer's guild uh, retreat and I was talking to some TV writers. They're telling me about ah, TV's great, man, because it's the writer's medium. It's not the director's not in charge. It's writers in charge. And uh, the director's your bitch, man. And I'm thinking, well, hi, diddly D. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> that sounds good. And, and and so I I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I called one of the guys up and I said, hey, what's the format for a TV show? And he gave me the format. And, you know, it's teasers, five acts, and a, uh, you know, uh, uh, something at the end, I guess six acts I, I i forget what it was it was silly at the time so i did this thing it was a pilot and at that point i'm like i'm 37 years old and the guys breaking into tv are like you know stem cells and so i'm i'm going well that was a useless exercise but at least i know how to do it i posted this thing and this guy read it and he worked for a guy named scott Winant. And Scott Winant was a Emmy winning um, director showrunner. And he read it and he said, man, this is great. Um, let's, let's try to do this. Um, had me over to his office. I was, you know, like uh, he, we talked about the project. It was, a, it was, it was very different than people I talked to in the movie business. Cause you'd get comments like can you know, movie business, movie notes were just, incomprehensible it would be well i don't love this can we make it more brown you know you're going what i don't even know what that means like like what but like dusty i mean that was from my western it was like you're dusty more dusty oh okay well um tv he was giving me like notes that i understood they were english you know i was like okay it needs to be this this scene doesn't work because of this change this up and then we got we're cooking with grease and I need a Bible, he says, I need a Bible. And I'm thinking, well, what's a Bible? <laughs> I don't know what a, bio, a Bible, and he says, oh, it's thing you just, you know, you, you talk about the, the, um, the show, where it's going, what the, what the episodes are going to be, um, the major story arcs, and you describe all the characters. So I sat down and I just, again, I had this opportunity to dazzle somebody. And so I was like, I'm going to make this Bible. So I started writing what it, I figured he had described and I started getting really bored. And if you're bored with what you're writing, nobody's going to be interested in reading it. Um, and so I just said, you know, I'm going to make this interesting for me. So I, I said, what if all these, what if this had happened? What if this was real? And so I started creating it as if like I was this very dry college professor who was looking into this weird carnival that happened in the thirties. And I had, you know, fake interviews, fake religious tracts, fake newspaper articles. Um, I just created this whole thing that felt like a documentary about the carnival. And um, I gave it to him and he was like, wow, this is great. Let's, so we went to HBO and they looked at it. And they go, did this really happen? Is this based on a real, a real thing? I'm going, no, it's magical realism for God's sake. And, and um and it was it was really this was the time when there were just doctors lawyers and cops on tv and so this was a real weird show and um and hbo decided to pick it up and they made me the executive producer um and um then i was a television producer writer that was my big moment you know i'd had a brief stint on a staff on a show called wolf lake before once i got this deal and I wrote the pilot. We're waiting to hear back from HBO. I got a gig on this show called Wolf Lake. So that was my first staff experience. And that's sort of, you know, it's, uh, so my, my way in when I get those questions of, yeah, what's the best way to get into TV? I'm not that guy. I'm not that. My entree to television is the equivalent of going to a Lakers game and if they're, they bring out the t-shirt cannon and if you get the red t-shirt, you get to go down and, you know, shoot from, you know, half court. And if you get a basket, you win a car. That was my, that was the equivalent of, of the luck involved in how I ended up breaking into television as a, an executive producer on an HBO series. Um, the regular route is 
you get a job as an assistant, writer's assistant, and you're bringing coffee. And eventually maybe you're in the room. Um, you're the writers, you're basically the, the, the writer's assistant. You're not just a PA. And then enough time in the room, you get to know things, maybe you're learning and you get a job as a story editor. So it really is almost like learning how to be a, it's like plumbing, you know, it's like uh, there's a set kind of apprenticeship that goes on. Um, I kind of like the way, I, I like the way I got into it, not because it was so like fast, <laughs> um, but because I got to live a whole life before I did it. And um, it's really important to dig your story well. Um, and um, otherwise all you're doing is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And so I had led a, a deep, I'd led, I had 20 years of adult life um, um, and had three kids and had seen one of them through, you know, um, a serious illness and, you know, had struggled to keep my marriage together and had, you know, dealt with a lot of, you know, a lot of important adult issues and all those things inform my writing. I also, you know, early I had enough time to do stupid things like, you know, get arrested and do drugs. And <laughs> I didn't get arrested for me, arrested for like, you know, traffic warrants and crap like that, you know, just stupid, stupid stuff. I mean, and hitchhiking, you know, and, and, and finding yourself in, in dangerous situations. I mean, all, everything kind of goes into the story well and um and and it becomes something you're drawing on for some emotional truth with your characters as you're dramatizing a scene um it's you don't have to exactly live that moment but all you need to do is tap into what's it like to be shit scared you know um and then you filter that through the character you know, it's not, nobody's interested, you know, people go, well, that's not what I would say. You know, you're writing dialogue. It's like, what would I say here? Hmm. What would I say if I was in this situation? Okay, well, nobody cares because you're really not that interesting. Your character is very interesting. So you, what you have to do is you have to really know your character and then you don't, you're never going, what is that character? What would he say in that situation? You're just sitting and transcribing what your character says in that situation. You're in it, you're listening, and the character says something. And sometimes it's the, something, you, you know, where'd that come from, you know? Um, that's when you really know you're, you're, you know, you're writing at that point, you know? It takes a while to get to a point um, where, you're, where you're good enough. That just takes a lot of time and work of, you know, of just continuing to, to, to build your craft up. Um, but eventually, like for me, when I'm, when I'm deep in a script, it's like, I am, I'm just transcribing. Uh, I mean, I'm sitting in the room, the characters are talking, they're doing things. Some of them are expected. Sometimes the character does something totally unexpected or says something completely unexpected. And it's like, that, well, that's what he said. Let's see where he goes with it, you know? Um, and, and then you get something that's, it's, it's, it's an organic kind of quality to the writing where it's like watching a flower open rather than something that's a slave to uh, an outline, you know? But anyway, that went all over the place. <laughs> it's true though, I get what How did saying. I get into TV? I, yeah, but you know, but it's, it's it, it seems like, I mean, there you were with Carnavale and you were, you were, you had finished your Wolf Lake and then you were on. And how did you, how did you learn to write TV? Was it a smooth process? Was it uh, challenging? You had a lot of writing experience at that point. Um, well, first of all, Carnival was very, very close to me. Um, they brought in a showrunner, a guy who had, had a lot, he was very seasoned, had a lot of experience. And he proceeded to sort of like, well, this is nice, but I'm going to make it great. You know, and um, I just went, okay, well, I just want to learn as much as I can from this guy. And what I did was I what I was learning from this guy is how to take a go project and, 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 you know, turn a green light into a red light. Cause that's what he was doing. And I, I was listening to the network. They were saying, don't monkey, don't monkey with this. We like this. Don't monkey with it. And he get monkey in with it. And I realized, Oh my God, this guy's running the, running this plane right into a mountain, you know? And so uh, he had two scripts that they'd written past the pilot and, 
I just went and I wrote two scripts that were my, I just wrote two alternate versions of the, the, the next two episodes, knowing he was going to fail. And so I called up uh, Carolyn Strauss at HBO and I said, he's going to turn these in. You guys are not going to be happy with them. And uh, before you pull the plug, could you please just let me send these other two in? Other, if you love them, great. Well, we'll do them. But she said, sure. So um, they got them. And then like uh, three, four days later, the, they, pulled the, they pulled the plug on the show. And I sent mine in and then they put the plug back in you know, so, um, and got a new showrunner. And that was Ron Moore, who's very capable, came out of the star, you know, the Star Trek land. And, um, and he and I worked on season one together. So um, it's, it's a little bit different working with a staff. Um, I think it's really exciting. It's, it's very social. Um, and, um, you know, there's, there's, um, I like staff writing. Uh, it, but it, it can it can you know it's i've worked on shows where there's not a functioning room and and that's not fun um and then i've worked on rooms where yeah the, the, it you know and i'm good at making rooms i'm i'm good at making rooms function you know i get it i take care of my people and get them excited and you know this is gonna be the best thing you've ever done <laughs> so I'm, I guess I'm naturally nurturing or whatever. So anyway, um, so yeah, no, writing for television is like, it's like writing for movies. It's the same thing. It's drama, it's, it's, it's drama, you know, you're a dramatist. Um, it's different than writing novels uh, where, you know, you only have two out of five sentences to work with, you know? It, so, you know, sight and sound, that's it. And, um, you don't have people, you don't have unlimited time to get across your scene across. And so, you know, you got to keep it moving. You got to, you know, it, you start the scene. This is like William Goldman's advice and like second <laughs> and third. And you start the scene at the first possible or at the very last possible second. You start the scene, you end it at the very first possible second. Unless you're British and then you start it. And somebody knocks on a door. And then they talk about making tea and do they want one lump or two? And then somebody says, why are you fucking my wife? You know, and that's like, that's, that's British. That's the British system in the United States. We just start out with a, with that big line, you know? Um, so you really want to start as close to when something happens as possible. And, and it's okay. Don't try to do that while you're writing, do it later. When you're editing, look at a scene say, okay, when does this scene start to come alive? And you could probably cut everything before that, you know? And it's usually junk. It's usually just you warming up. So it's like, um, and the same thing is like when a scene starts to run out of gas, you go, eh, it's kind of, uh, yeah, it's time to end the scene, cut to something else, you know? Don't waste people's time. I mean, that's one of my one of the talks I have with, with, with rooms, I go, okay, here's the thing is, is what we're doing is we're, we're basically the most, you know, the most precious thing a person has. It's not money. It isn't their card. It isn't their, it isn't, you know, you could say maybe it's their health, I suppose as an adjunct, but the main thing is you have X amount of time on this planet. Okay. Where you're alive. You're only going to draw breath for so long. We're asking people to give us some of that time. Okay. And that person's never going to get that hour back. And if you don't, you know, in a, and we're in the mass media business, so there could be a million somebody's out there and they're all watching your show for an hour. And if you don't do your best to entertain them in that hour, then you've just smoked a million hours of human life. I mean, I take that very seriously. That's like, that's not a good thing from a karmic standpoint. Um, and I may not, work out i may not entertain them it may not be the best thing they've ever seen but i'm gonna die trying to make it the best thing they've ever seen um so i think that's the attitude you have to have when you're asking strangers for their time you know is make it worth their while don't don't take them for granted um don't 
don't presume they want to listen to you, you know, go on and on about something to get something off your chest. They're not your shrink, you know. Um, they want to be, they want to, they want to be enlightened. They want to be moved, you know. Um, and and so you you move heaven and earth to to have that happen. That's nice. I know I want to ask you some more about some other shows. I'd love to ask you about the astronauts, but uh, let's talk a little bit about the astronauts. Tell us about the, sure. you've written a lot of genres, a lot of different genres. How was the astronaut oh, yeah. for you? It's a little different. It was weird. I, I was I was thinking maybe they, they got my name mixed up with somebody else's name or something. Um, I, I, I was like, I, I was a super dark horse candidate, if anything. And I got called into this meeting with Imagine Kids and Family. <clears throat> I'm sorry. And I, um, they, they said they were doing this show. I was thinking, wow, you do know what I've done because I mean, I'm like, like the Prince of Darkness, you know? Um, and they said, we're doing this show. It's about kids who get launched into space. And it's, it's in, in five kids end up, you know, um, you know, on this journey of a lifetime. And so I told them, well, look, here's the thing is the way I see this show is it's like, we're doing a tightrope walk over a cauldron of cheese of just boiling cheese, because this could get really cheesy, really fast. And, um, the way I want to approach it is like, if you launched five kids into space and what would they be going through? And some of this is going to be scary and some of it's going to be very perilous and, as far as the parents go, I'm not going to write any dumb parents, smart kids stuff. I don't do that. Um, the parents might make mistakes because they're on the ground and the kids are up there in space. Kids are closer to the problem. They might be better able to determine what to do or what kind of risk they're willing to take because parents are you know, very protective. Like they'll want the kids to do the safe thing every time. And as, you know, as somebody who used to ride motorcycles, you know, the safe thing is not always to put on the brakes. Sometimes you've got to accelerate your way out of a problem. And, you know, a parent will always saying, slow down, slow down, slow down. That's what parents do. And sometimes the kids are going to have to goose it to get out and, and defy their parents. And the question is, when they do that, you know, it's, it's not a bunch of parents saying, you were right, we were wrong. It's parents saying, how could you do that? You have any idea how dangerous that was. Um, don't ever do that again. You know, um, the real, the real, real life, what parents and children do, you know, um, and they responded very well. They, that's what we want you to do. And Nickelodeon said, yeah, that's what we want. That's what we want. We don't want to do something. And it was with Imagine. And, then, you know, you're doing a space, something about space with Imagine, with Ron Howard's company. And so we did it. And it was a beautiful show. It only lasted a season. And that was really because of COVID. And we got shut down for a while and our kids just, you know, they were at that point in life where they, you know, a year down and all of a sudden they've developed into like young, young adults in, you know, physically and, you know, barring having them say, okay, we're going to go through some cosmic rays that suddenly gave us breasts and hips, you know, um, there was, <laughs> there was no way to really do it. Plus I think uh, Nickelodeon, they really, they were, they committed to it. Um, but I think at the end of the day, they looked at their business model and it, it just didn't make that much sense, you know? Yeah, yeah I get it. But um, cool. So we only, we only did one season, but it's a gorgeous season of TV I and mean, it's great. It's first rate kids programming. And if you have children and, and adults watch it and, and, and enjoy it, there's some, there's some really dark, deep stuff in there um, about, you know, like existential stuff um that these some of these kids go through in it and uh and we really got it was funny the stuff we couldn't get away with you know like it would be like i'd suggest something like oh what if the kids find some alcohol the one of the one of the adults had put on board and is using it to cope you know um the nickelodeon people are going ah no <laughs> we're no, you're not doing that okay oh, well it would have been interesting you know but it's kids programming. So we got to keep our, keep things in mind, but it's, um, I'm very proud of it. 
I'm very proud of the year we got. Okay. But I don't want to, I want to talk more about TV, but I also know that you've done comic books. So I don't want to, I know that we have a lot of comic book fans here. So I want to make sure that we talk a little bit about that. Well, the comic book thing was, yeah, it was sort of a strange thing. I had Marvel come to me after Carnival went off the air. And um, I, uh, I had, I had, I had a, uh, they said we could do anybody. Well, well, first they said, we want to do Carnival. We want to finish Carnival. I said, well, that's fantastic. And then HBO said, well, we'll do it, but we got to own, we get to own the art. And Marvel said, that's not what we do. That's not our business model. And HBO said, well, it's, no way. well, HBO just at that point, I mean, they didn't really care. So it's like, no, we're not going to do that. So Marvel said, well, we want to do something with you. What, which one of our characters would you like to do? And I said, well, wow. Iron Man. Because he has, he's not bitten by a spider. He doesn't, he's not exposed to gamma rays. He's just this rich dude who built a, built a the, uh, armor that flies around. And I kind of, and he's drunk. So let's, let's do that one. And, um, and so, so uh, at the time, I mean, I was not eager to do, do comic books, but my son was in his early twenties, Charlie, and he was a massive comic book fan. And I said, look, I'll do it, but I want to do it with my kid. And the reason was really, in a way, selfish. I'd seen what Angelie had done with the Hulk. And sometimes people who, are at a, who aren't into comics think, oh, well, I'm going to transcend this form. And it's like, no, thank you very much. It's already developed. This is the way it is. And trying to look down your nose at comic books and comic book heroes is the exact wrong way to do it and um i knew that charlie would keep me honest you know he and he did very often he said well, we can't do that that won't work you know not 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 for this character and um so i knew he'd be uh, good but i wanted to do teach him how to do scene work and there's a good opportunity for that so they said yeah okay you can do it with your son and so i call up charlie i said Hey, Charlie, guess what? He goes, what? I said, you and I are writing Iron Man together for, for Marvel comic books. And he goes, shut up. And I said, no, we're writing Iron Man for Marvel comics. Click, he hangs up. I call him back. He, he picks up, hello, Charlie, click. You know, it's like, okay, finally I get to, Charlie, Charlie, we're writing Iron Man, okay? And, and he goes, yeah, okay, great, April Fool's. And I realized I'd called him April 1st. <laughs> and he really thought it was just, it was April, this, like a life, this, this April Fool's stuff. And we ended up writing uh, Iron Man for like two years and, um, and wrote him through the Civil War series they had. And we did some, Cap, we did a Captain America issue, um, zero point um, sort of throwback to his days in, in World War II. And, and then we did the Eternals, and Charlie pretty much led on that one. By then, he knew what he was doing, and and you know, I I, I just sort of like um, was I was sort of a, backing him up on that. So he was made mainly. What I would do is he would always write the first draft, and then I would sit down and we would re do all the rewrites together. And by then, I didn't really, I barely needed to rewrite. So those were all pretty much a hundred percent his. So. That's awesome. I, I want to, I, I have many questions, but we also have a lot of audience members that have questions. So let me, let me get into that. And um, you've been offering wonderful advice. A lot of these are, so yes, we have some recent graduates um, like Miguel wondering. Wait, 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 one more piece of advice before I get your oh, questions. Yes, It'll be quick. Yeah. If you want to be a dramatist and you want to learn how to write scripts, okay. Take a tip from this big loser named like William Shakespeare. Yeah. You know? And um learn how to act i don't care how shy you are take some acting classes okay and i mean serious acting classes i mean spend about a year doing it okay um i didn't really become a really good writer until i had done that it changes everything so um it, it makes you see a writing for 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 drama is like basically you're improving by yourself on a page and you learn 
most importantly, well, how hard it is to do bad stuff. Good stuff is really easy on stage. And, you know, when you're in the process of taking a good professional acting class, you'll get crap, you know, you get crappy things, unmotivated speeches and things where you just go, how do I do this? This is just pure exposition. This is junk. And they'll teach you, you know, okay, here's how to get through that. Learning how to act, even if you have no intention of ever doing it in front of anybody ever, even if you're really shy. And I'm like that. I mean, I had trouble breaking the fourth, you know, just I had trouble putting that fourth wall up um, in front of people. But if, you've got to put that fourth wall up when you're in your room by yourself writing um, and immerse yourself in the story and be present in the scene while you're writing it. it and um, my 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 wife, you know, looks at me when I'm writing and it's like I'm just somewhere else. You know, I mean, she she can talk to me and I'll nod and I'll even make eye contact, but I'm not present, you know, um, but you acting is a really important discipline and it applies to your writing. So anyway, that's that's it. It's great advice. It's great advice. All right. We have uh, I, I want to hear, I think, students, uh, we have some students and guests who want more advice from you. So I'm going to I'm going to lay it on you with the questions from the audience here. OK. Um, other advice, any other advice for recent grad, so recent graduates looking for work in film and TV, any advice for them? Well, you know, just try to, you know, be, don't be afraid to contact anybody, you know, who's in the business. And if you're a writer, um, it's trying to, it's like, it's, your stuff's not going to sell unless you get it in front of people and get them to read it. Okay. So, you know, get as many people to read your stuff as possible. Enter some contests if they're not too expensive. There's a lot of, you know, hustling out there um, uh, where it costs a huge amount of money to enter a contest. Um, but there's some good there's some good film festival contests. Um, enter those. Do take um, look into classes and look into workshops. Um, sometimes, like the first thing I ever sold. I sold because there was somebody who was working for a low budget film company who was just sort of hanging out and waiting to see if there was something that maybe they might want. So sometimes there's, there's people in the audience that might buy your stuff. Um, but most, most importantly, just always just be out there. Just, just, I did, I didn't really succeed until I just said, I'm going to do one thing every day to push the ball forward. And it could be, you know, I'm going to write a page or two. I'm, I'm going to make a call or two. Um, and, um, you know, just to get somebody to read this, you know. Um, and so it's, it's really just, you know, and build your network, you know, try to make friends and, 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 uh, you know, of peers, you'll find that in like workshops, you know, like some of the independent workshops around town. I don't know if they still do script writers network out there. Um, there's quite a few in LA of just these things where you pay a few bucks every, every month to go to a workshop. Um, but just get out there and do it. And, and one thing about, you know, if you have some friends that, can, that are actors, you have a friend who has, wants to be a director, you know, just go, go make movies, put them on YouTube, you know? Um, any place you can display what you're doing, you know, any place you can showcase what you're doing of course be careful because you know if you have people come up at you and they want you to do shit for free um and then they tell you well this will be great for exposure um just remember that you know that's 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 like you know people die of exposure <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's like on on people's like death certificates you died of exposure um so, so don't let people, you know, don't, don't be let, don't, I mean, you let people, let me go this way. If, if like Will Smith wants you to write a, a something for him, great, you know, go do that and do it for free. If he wants you to do it for free. Um, but if Joe Blow, who, you know, is, is at the cor corner table at Denny's in, in North Hollywood and seems skeezy, wants you to write a, a feature script for free based on some idea he has, um, and that's probably not such a good thing to do. And you better write something uh, from an idea you have, you know? And why would you want, you only have X number of scripts inside you. Why would you want to waste 
some one of those scripts on you know on on skeezy mcskeezerton at the you know at the denny's you know absolutely well we're almost we're almost at time so we can probably do one more question um i'll do two no matter what oh okay well there we go um do you have any, I think, I think you're giving such great advice. I just want to keep going with the advice. You know, you, you worked very hard at balancing a family life, a career, and your writing for a really long time. And we have a lot of students and we have a lot of people who are listening who are doing exactly the same thing. Any, any advice for them, how to sustain, how to sustain them through that process? Well, I broke, I broke it in my forties. I didn't take it really seriously until I was about 40. Um, I, I think the, I think, like I said, I think the main thing I've, is the advice I've already given, which is do one thing every day. I think it's great advice. Um, and really I can't overstress the importance of the acting. I, I honest will like, like the reason I did it was again, by accident, I thought I want to be a director and I thought, you know, if I'm going to be a director, I should learn how to act and at least understand what the process is. And that's what Cliff Osmond taught me. And what I didn't understand is I was learning how to write in that class. And I would really strongly recommend finding a, a professional caliber acting group um, and, and, uh, and just get up, get up there and do it. Usually these things, they're all over town. It's usually, they give you a page, they let you do it cold, you know, and then you get up there and you do it again with a little bit of rehearsal. And then you do it again and you tape it and then you watch it on tape the last week, usually four week cycles. And um, you will become a better writer doing this. You know, all the good writers I know have, have had it, have some acting in their background. That's awesome. All right, I'm checking. I think we might have, you said two. So I'm going to go for another question. Um, many people want to know how to get an agent. <laughs> Throw an ashtray. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, getting an agent um, is a, kind of overrated, frankly. I, I mean, yeah, it's helpful. You'll get, you'll get one at some point. I've had many, you know. Um, uh, the way I did it and the way I suggest people do it is first of all, you got to have something to show them. So as soon as you've got a script, okay. And you feel good about it. Um, and everybody in your workshop thinks it's tops, you know, and, um, in, I mean, not just mom thinks it's tops. I mean, people you don't know think it's tops. So what you do is you get a list of agents from the writer's guild. Okay. Now they'll say some were willing to look at, you know, you, you don't need a referral. Some are open to, oh, well, screw those guys. They're, they're losers. Um, you just go to the biggest agencies, work your way down. You know who they are. And you call. And, you, and the first thing you do is you get to some guy, okay? And you go, hi, I just graduated from NYU. And I finished my master's script. And I was... I was wondering who would be willing, I want to send a letter, a letter, a query letter. I want to send a letter to the person who handles new writers. Yeah. And they'll maybe give you a name. Maybe they'll just blow you off, but maybe you'll get a name if you're not, you know, obnoxious or silly. Um, and you're just sending a letter, right? It's not a big deal. You just want to know who, who handles new writers. They're probably going to give you one of the new agents, probably one of the, the green agents. So now you got a name, okay? So you drum your fingers for about 30 seconds, and then you get back on the phone. And let's say the name they gave you was, you know, uh, Janet Stevens. So you pick up the, the guy, same guy picks up the phone. You go, yeah, Janet Stevens, please. And they go, oh, so now they put you through to Janet Stevens' office. Now you're going to get Janet Stevens' assistant. And you say, Hi, and you're, you know, you give your name. Hi, I'm Dan Knopf. Um, look, uh, is Janet around? And they go, well, she's not in the office right now. Or she can't take a call. Or she's on another call. Can I ask what this is regarding? You say, well, I understand she's the person who, you know, really likes fresh new talent. And I've been told that I should send my script to her. I just graduated from um, USC, <laughs> USC, UCLA, NYU. 
okay? It, it doesn't matter, okay? Nobody's gonna care if it's good, okay? Nobody will ever care, okay? You can have a drink with Janet six months later and say, oh, and she goes, you know, it's funny. I knew this doctor, in, this professor at NYU. Did you ever study under? I never went to NYU. You liar. They don't care. They're getting 10%. They don't care. Okay. So then you say, who, you know, do I say, I'd like to, I, yeah, I, that's the first person. Can I send her my script? Well, now it's something new, you know? And if they put you through to Janet, you have a conversation with Janet. Okay. And you say, yeah. And you better have your log line. Okay. I've got this script. Um, and, and it's, this, this is what the log line is. It's what it's about. And, uh, I was wondering, you know, I, I know that it would be so great if you could read it and at least just give me your thoughts, you know, be now, remember you're asking for a big favor there. That's a big ask. It takes about 45 minutes to read a script and they're busy people. To me, it's like handing somebody you don't know on the street corner, your baby who has just shat her diaper and said, can you hold my baby for 45 minutes while I go shopping? It's, you're putting them out. So, um, uh, you know, but you know, you do that you make those calls. You just keep making those calls and eventually somebody's gonna rep you. And somebody say, I like the script and, and they'll, they'll maybe take it out for you. Um, but you know, then you'll be with them for a while and then you'll be with somebody else. And, that's agenting. You know, you'd be just as good calling up a producer and saying this, going, doing the same scam. Just get your shit, get your shit read. Get it read by the right people. You know, if you get your script read, like for instance, I didn't have an agent when I sold my first script. I went to the producer and I said, oh, I need an agent now. I just sold, we just sold my script. He said, oh, so we, he put me in touch with a guy over at CAA and that guy was my agent for that project. So it can go backwards too. That's awesome. All right. Well, you've given, you've given Matt, it. Uh, the, the agent is not like the golden ticket in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Right. It's, yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I, I think Terry is coming back to us. Yay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Daniel, for all your advice and for your time. We know how busy you are and we're so you know, every time we get to hear from past alum, we we feel so excited and proud to be part of the same university that, you know, people like yourself have been part of. So thank you for your well, time. Speaking of that, just yeah, when you're at you, when Cal State LA, you're getting a fine education. You've got a great department. But, you, you know, sometimes when I talk to you about like, oh, yeah, tell me what's to NYU, you know, it's just like, it's like telling people I got a Gucci purse. <laughs> it's just brand name. You're getting a fine education. At Cal State Los Angeles, as good as any any college you go to, the it's just that there's Hollywood is so fake and shallow that they just hear those three things and they're magic words, you know. <laughs> may I just may I just add a quick poll here for everybody? It just allows us to find out who's actually attending here. So it's just one question that I'll, I'll launch now, if you could kindly just respond to it super quickly. It just gives a, a better idea of uh, who's attending. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure to co-host you on behalf of the Entertainment and Arts Alumni Network and the CSU Entertainment Alliance. As proud Cal State LA graduates, volunteers, and professionals, we wanna take a moment to ask each of you to consider sharing your expertise with your community. Um, so we are always looking for volunteers who would be interested, interested in being um, our next keynote or panelists. So please reach out and let us know if you're interested. We hope you enjoyed yourselves and are logging off with some valuable, um, you know, valuable tools and advice that was given to us today by Daniel. And have a great evening, everyone, and take care. Hey, Thank good you, luck, Daniel. Guys. Keep working and keep just getting better. That's all. That's the best advice I can give you. Just get better and better every day with, the, with, with your craft. Just keep working. Eventually, it's going to happen for you. It's inevitable. If you just keep going, don't let anybody tell you to stop. You know, you, you, you only, it's only when uh, the only one who can, you know, the only one who can stop you is yourself. You just keep plugging away. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, Daniel.
Thank you, Christina.